was just so into it and that enthusiasm never wavered. And I knew immediately, like the very first day I walked into a pro wrestling school, I said, oh, I should have did this a long time ago. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Out of Character. I'm your host, Ryan Satin, here in Los Angeles, California, in the Fox Sports studios, broadcasting not live from my chair. Welcome back to another episode, guys. Lovely to have you, as always. Thank you for joining me here. This week on the show, we got Carrie and Cross, someone who I have been wanting on the show for a while, someone who... I chat with every now and then, and I think that he is very different in real life as, than the character that he portrays on TV. So if you've never seen one of his interviews, if you don't know too much about the guy, you're going to learn a lot about him here. So make sure you stick with the whole episode. Lots of fun stuff within it. This is episode 99. 99! I can't believe that we are at episode 99. Next week is episode 100. I'm a little stressed. I don't fully have the people person booked yet but i'm working on it i'm trying to get a big guest i had a little bit of a delay uh but man 99 episodes can't believe we're almost at 100 i will talk more about how excited i am about episode 100 100 next week but for those of you who've been watching all these shows thank you so much for sticking through it we're almost there we're almost at episode 100 huge milestone for out of character but before we get to episode 100. We got episode 99 with Carrie and Cross, so go check it out. All right, we are here with Carrie and Cross. Carrie and Cross, thank you so much for joining me today. I got you in right under the wire, right before episode 100, so you can't give me too much crap for, for not having you on sooner, but I'm glad that we finally got to do it after, I think, I think we've had multiple times where it was booked and then something happened and it didn't go down, but now you're here and we finally get to chat. How you doing, man? I'm doing very good, man. It's uh, good to finally be here. <laughs> yes, it is good to finally have you here as well. Before we get into everything, I want to start this off asking you what I ask every single guest on this show, and that is how much of your real true self is there in the character that you play on TV? Very, very little. Very little. I find it more therapeutic from a performance standpoint to completely step outside myself and play... Uh, something in this particular situation for this company larger than life. I, I've always wanted to get into a character to bring to life for people that they're not going to be able to see anywhere else, you know? Yeah, you know, it's funny. You know, you're someone who I text with every once in a while and I've had conversations with, and you're definitely one of those people who is so far from the intense character that you play on TV. You're fairly laid back. Uh, you're You're definitely not like this constant scary man like you are on television and it's funny to see the difference between the two i get that a lot <laughs> i get that a lot i hid from people for a very long time before like uh media became like a total necessity i i kept my cards pretty close to my chest you know um i remember meeting a lot of fans especially in the indies that were terrified of me um i even met wrestlers i won't throw them <laughs> under the bus some of them are my friends now but I would meet wrestlers that were terrified of me. And they would be like, dude, please don't suplex me on the top of my head tonight. Like, I've got a show on Saturday, a show on Sunday. Is there any way we can get out of the spot? And I'd be like, God, relax. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, relax. You know? And I was always proud of that. Uh, but, yeah, I, I know what you mean. I think it's, you know, beyond just you know, the character that you play too. Like you are fairly like big, intense looking dude, even though you are easygoing, I could see, you know, someone working with you being like, Oh man, I hope this guy doesn't just start shooting on me out there. Cause he's intense. Yeah. I mean, it's, and I, 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 I understand that. I understand that aspect of it. I came up with a combat sports background. Like my father was an amateur wrestler. My grandfather was a boxer. I have a lot of uncles. I have like six uncles and an aunt, all near the kids, huge family. And all of us have been involved with combat sports from a very early age. So, you know, like I legitimately do know what I'm doing um, from that standpoint. You know what I mean? Yep. We're talking about shooting and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay. So wait, I want to know more about that. So the combat sports background, your grandpa was a boxer. Your dad did uh, combat sports. Tell me more about that. I'm interested. 
Uh, I think I'm pretty sure I was so young, but I'm pretty sure my father was um, a gold medalist in the Pan Am Games of Crazy. either 89 or 91 for Puerto Rico uh, for wrestling. Um, and one of my grandfathers, I was close with both of them. One of them was uh, like a champion in the army. Like they had their own boxing division, like in-house. Um, but yeah, I just, I grew up waking up in the morning with my dad and going out in like very cold New York winters and um, like the 6 a.m. practices and, and watching people spar and train and stuff like that. That's always been a part of my life. Even when I moved to Canada, I would, I'd still be involved recreationally on some sort of level with it. And I did, I did compete um, in grappling, like jujitsu, catch wrestling, stuff like that at a very low level. It's called Grappler's Quest. I did that for a long time too. And um, I've just always been interested in martial arts. Like I was born in 85. So the whole world was on the rise with Jean-Claude Van Damme and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Stallone. Everybody wanted to kick like Van Damme. And, um, you know, then when you, you, know, you start studying martial arts, you learn that there's a little bit more to it than just being able to do like a flashy high kick, which can turn you into a millionaire if you have a good one, let's be honest. Um, but I've just always been involved in martial arts my whole life. Kyoko Shinkai, Jiu Jitsu, catch wrestling, Sambo, Western style boxing, Dutch kickboxing. There was actually a guy, He's not super famous, but his name is Mauricio Veil. He was part of the old guard of Shute Box. And people may remember that from uh, like Pride Fighting Championship, Vanderlei Silva. He had moved up to Toronto, Canada while I was living there. And I was one of his students for a long time. And then I eventually transitioned to one fight team in Vegas. So is that, okay, so see that I was gonna, cause you're someone who I've noticed really likes Japanese, you know, MMA or, you know, wrestling out there and stuff. Is that why kind of like, did that enter your life early because you were into mixed martial arts stuff from a young age? Yeah, I was raised into like uh, martial arts and stuff like that. I'll be honest, when I was little, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. I just, you know, wanted to play with my friends. And, you know, when you're a kid, you are you don't understand the benefits of structure and discipline. And uh, my father pushed me through it. And then as I got older, I was like, oh, wow, thank you for pushing me through that. Now this is like, you know, the benefits that came from that are you know, improving every aspect of my life. Communications. No one ever thinks about how martial arts would improve your communications with people, but it does. You learn a lot about yourself, your own temperament, um, what sort of learner you are, whether you're audibly or visual. Um, it was very good for me. So, uh, but I mean, I, I've always been a wrestling fan too, since I was very little. Like I would come home from like these boxing practices when I was little and I would immediately put on WWE watching Hulk Hogan and Macho Man and Ultimate Warrior. So the two have kind of been hand in hand in a funny way. What did your dad think about that back then? He liked it. He thought it was funny. Like he would dress up as the Iron Sheik for Halloween. He loved Iron Sheik. Um, and he was a big guy too. Um, he liked it, but like a lot of parents, you know, when their kids have these wild aspirations, these big dreams, they don't want to like crush them, but they want their kids to remain somewhat realistic. And, you know, in society, somewhat realistic translates to what is immediately available. And becoming a WWE superstar is the farthest thing possible away from being, you know, readily available to do. So he entertained it, but like most people in my family, you know, we're all like working class. Um, some people in my family are in the service and um, we're just very grounded. Um, amongst our, our neighborhoods and our culture and stuff like that. Like, there's nobody famous in our family. So, you know, as a little kid, when you say you want to do this when you grow up, it's kind of like, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, you do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned, you know, it's funny, you mentioned martial arts and how that it brought a discipline to you from a young age. And I do think that that is present from just seeing you on social media and stuff. You do seem like, disciplined you know you don't you don't really let social media negativity get to you you seem to you know do you you, you know you have a workout stuff you, you're very focused on what you need to accomplish for yourself and i think that 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 makes sense now knowing that you've been doing martial arts from such a young age oh and thank you for saying that i appreciate that yeah, I think that, you know, uh, discipline is important. I think I I was watching I was watching videos of my childhood and there was not uh, recently because I've just been going through all these old videos and 
I, discipline was not what I initially had. I just saw these videos of me just running around screaming. I hit, I hit my dad with a bat at one, well, the toy bat, but I hit my dad with a bat at one point and the camera like instantly turns off when I do it. And I was like, oh no, I probably got in trouble there. Uh, you know, in your bio, I think it's in your bio or something somewhere on your social media. Um, and just from following you, it seems like you're also pretty into philosophy too. Yeah, big time. Um, I grew up uh, fairly religious, um, family's Christian, and I would hit certain points in my life where I felt like, for me personally, that wasn't enough. And I began to kind of lean into philosophy. Like it just kind of by happenstance, I began to learn about philosophy, different types of philosophers and stuff like that. I got really big into stoicism. This is like in my early 20s, you know, which for a lot of people is like the most frustrating period of lives they're coming right out of school it's a massive transition all of a sudden like school's done and you always like you've always wanted school to be done and um now like school's done you almost like don't even know what to do with yourself like if you're not going to post-secondary you know education college university or something you go out of the working world and there's just no empathy <laughs> no sympathy <laughs> it's very harsh you, you know if you don't have mentors in your life or you're afraid to discuss certain things that you might feel insecure about with your parents then you just don't discuss them and like it's a very frustrating period for everybody very much specifically so. yeah specifically in western culture so i found you know going back and forth between like faith and philosophy um worked very well for me in terms of like helping me find the answers that i needed um, i never necessarily found answers specifically in reading something but just to expand my own perspective on what i was dealing with in everyday life um i felt like i got a lot out of that if any of that makes any sense no absolutely i think it makes perfect sense because i'm someone who when i was younger and to this day religion just doesn't quite make sense to me i guess you know like even sure. e even with you know my dad's passing like recently like it's tough to like figure out what I think about when it comes to the afterlife and faith and all that kind of stuff. But um, I do think that personal accounts from people and wisdom does seem to help me more than just like, you know, talking about religion and stuff. No, I totally get it. I go back and forth on it all the time. I mean, like, since you brought it up, you know, like I had reached out to you when I had heard that that happened, that I've been dealing with uh, passings and stuff like that. Um, recently like a lot in like the past five or six years and that's always very difficult stuff to process you know what i mean it's yeah. it's, it's totally difficult but um yeah i tend to kind of juggle between both of those types of things and it, and it kind of levels me out i just always look at like you know i don't i'm not like anti-religion i'm not like, like an atheist or something like that i just always kind of I've always looked at religion just from a personal standpoint very differently but i've always felt like with religion itself no matter what religion you practice that Ultimately, it's to help you with the thing that we're talking about right here, dealing with the afterlife, dealing with these really heavy things like death, whether it's coming for you in years or whatever, or you're dealing with someone else's loss. And if that helps anyone to deal with that, then it's ultimately good. So that's why I'm not like anti-religion. It's just hard for me to like wrap my head around it because it's such like a, a tough concept, the afterlife. Bro, I... Uh problem with my with one of the doors in my house and i couldn't even attach the door back to the wall i can't tell you anything about how the afterlife works and not only that i have a picture of a vampire on the wall right behind me so i'm not the all-knowing you know what i mean i don't have all the answers you know what i mean i i can't stand people who pretend to to understand or have a strong grasp on how everything like everything works you know i take like a pretty mild manner approach um uh, to everything you know what I mean? Yep. I'm like a person, I, I feel like, and this is why martial arts actually works for me. I need like things, I need to understand the mechanics of things to really believe in them. And if I, if I can't really get into the mechanics of what it is that I'm doing um, or thinking about or what I'm trying to accomplish, then like, it's just not for me. God. I, I get it. Yeah, that makes such perfect, yeah, that, that clicked with me <laughs> perfectly. I, I completely feel the same way at times. Uh, when I brought up social media just now, uh, you kind of rolled your eyes uh, about how you don't let it phase you at all. Uh, do you think social media is a, a good thing, bad thing? Like, what are your thoughts on social media? I think it's a good thing, but I think um, this all just like became a thing with our generation. 
Like this is relatively new to the human species. And I think over time, it's probably going to be a while, people are going to have to think about um, what they really want to get out of social media and like what the benefits are behaving one way and what the consequences are of behaving the other. And I think when you introduce something like this to people and it feels consequence free, then they're going to experiment with no empathy or sympathy as to how it's going to affect other people. And, you know, by that merit, I don't know, I've just never really taken it that seriously. Like, it's nice to communicate with fans and have genuine responses and stuff. Like I've, I've met tons of people on social media from the beginning of my career that have been struggling with things in life, um, stuff like you and I were talking about with people passing and stuff. Like what we do for a living sometimes can provide people moments of relief, the ability to entertain them and take them away or out of something, or, or perhaps even helps them process it a little bit better, puts them in a better place, being able to entertain them. I've been able to have those uh, experiences literally start on social media before I was even on television and then transcend into independent shows. And then those people stay with me as I'm, you know, working with WWE, that type of stuff is amazing. Um, talking to people who are going through some sort of physical illness battle or something like that, or um, people who are disabled or people trying to cope with anything that's really difficult. Um, I've, I've met some of my favorite and best fans actually on social media that kind of have fallen into those particular categories. And if social media wasn't there, I probably would have not been able to connect with them and know that I, have the ability to improve their lives in some way shape or form yeah i think that is when you talk about the two different things you know the positives and the negatives the positives are you know people getting through all of this together in a way that just kind of like connects you and you have similar interests and you can kind of you know get through this thing called life together and make it easier and uh and then there are the ones who choose choose to make it a little more of a negative thing i think that you know you seem to me to me you seem to be someone who is a who's kind of all about like independent thought, you know, someone who is like people having their very, their own opinions, not following kind of like what a majority, you know, not thinking what just the majority thinks because the majority thinks it, but thinking for yourself. And I do think that oftentimes people get trapped in that on social media of just kind of like thinking what the majority thinks just because it'll get them more attention. Totally dude. Like I grew up, I was really lucky to grow up in like a pretty, First family. Um, so I grew up in New York, and on my dad's side, the family is Puerto Rican, Greek, Italian, and then my mom's side is like Scandinavian, Croatian, I think like Irish or English. We have like a very big like melting pot, um, and I never grew up like with sort of a tribal nature. Like I had two very distinct, different families and heritage um, on both sides. And I was just in, in boxing gyms, like everybody from every color and every race and every belief system is there. So I was like super fortunate to grow up around a lot of different um, concepts and ideas of diversity. And I've always kind of felt like it's been hard for me to express it in these words until like I got older. But I think people living together in harmony as individuals is definitely a possible thing. And I think being able to entertain and embrace different ideas without feeling like you're attacked or you have to attack somebody else, whether you agree or disagree is somewhere we're going to get to. And um, it's funny. I've seen it in two places. I've seen it in sports and I've seen it in music. And I would like to say too, I've seen it at WWE as well. I've seen it with wrestling audiences where people that may not agree with each other on absolutely anything can sit next to one another and enjoy a wrestling show. And I think that truly is magic. I think that's magic when you can do something like that. We can unify people together, even if it's for a brief moment. It doesn't matter where they're coming from or what they're doing. You know, to be able to do that, like that's what I can do for a living. I feel very good about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that harm bringing people together is so much better than dividing them. And that's definitely what pro wrestling does. Music, absolutely. You know, yes, absolutely. Could not agree more. So then you're in New York, you said, right? Vegas is where you start training, though, correct? Uh, I grew up in New York. I was there for about 10 or 11 years. Then I lived in Canada for okay. almost 20 years. Okay. I was primarily based out of Toronto, Canada. And then I lived in, uh, I lived in Las Vegas for around 10 years. Okay. So what were you doing in Vegas before wrestling? 
originally I moved to Las Vegas to fight pro. I wanted to fight uh, in the heavyweight division for mixed martial arts. Um, and I went to uh, one fight team. So it was Vanderlei Silva's school that was there. And then I transitioned over to syndicate mixed martial arts because they had a larger consistency of heavyweights there. I felt like that gave me a little bit more of a, um, a better idea of what areas you needed to improve on. Like beating up welterweights and light heavyweights all the time is, it's not the same as, you know what I mean, going with heavyweights. So, um, but all the while I was doing that, man, all I could think about was pro wrestling. <laughs> like I felt like I was going against, I felt like I was going against what I really wanted to do. And I had a stronger support system to do combat sports than I did pro wrestling. But eventually I just got to a point where I was like, I need to at least try this. I need to try this and get this out of my system. I can't go to my grade never trying to become a pro wrestler. This is all I'd ever wanted to do since I was a little kid. And the combat sports thing was more of a comfort zone. It wasn't a passion. You know, like I knew something was wrong when I was getting up in the morning for practices every day and I didn't want to go to practice. I knew something was wrong. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, the first week, I was like, ah, oh, maybe I'm uh Maybe I'm just tired. Maybe in my maybe I didn't drink enough water. You know, you try to rationalize it. Like it has to be my diet. I'm just in a bad mood. And then like it's two weeks, and it's like, boy, this has been a, a really long bad mood. <laughs> and then and then like a month or two months go by, and I'm just like, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. Oh my God, what do I do? My whole identity is wrapped up in this family, or like, and you know, they're telling me you're gonna be a world champion, you're gonna be a world champion, and then I gotta call them and tell them I'm not gonna do this anymore. I was like so worried about it at the time. And um, it didn't turn out to be a big of a deal as I thought it would be in my head at that time. You know, we get wrapped up and we think these things that we're doing are a part of our, our, you know, our identity, but they're not really. We just make them a part of it. Yeah, I. And it's kind of like how they say, you know, uh, you know, no one can make you change. You know, only you can make yourself change if you want to. And it's and it's very much that where it's like, I think. You know, especially if it's something that you were doing since you were a child, it was like, well, this is what I've always wanted to do. But then when you get to a certain age, you're like, well, maybe it's just kind of like what I thought I was supposed to do because it's what I saw everyone doing and maybe I want to do something else, you know. And so, uh, that, you know, I can I can completely understand that. Well, then, OK, so you make the call. Did you just stop doing MMA completely at that point and just go right sign up for a wrestling school and just start doing it? I trained recreationally, so I stopped going to the pro practices. There would be like two to three pro practices five days a week. And I just could not keep up with doing pro wrestling practice, which was five days a week. I chose to do it five days a week and that at the same time. And then I also kind of like, it would become hard sometimes for like the first six months. I'd almost get sort of like cold feet, like maybe I should take a couple of fights before I get into wrestling. You know, I would, I would start doing that. So I kind of had to like stop watching fighting on TV and I had to like, I just had to like stop going to the practices to just absolutely make sure that I was committed to one direction. Um, but the one thing that I noticed with pro wrestling practices when I got started, I never had a problem getting to them on time. I'd show up early. I'd be there, you know, extra time. I asked the guy who owned school his name is joe defalco he still has a school uh future stars of wrestling out in vegas i asked him if i can get a key to the building he was bringing the key for i said i want to come in saturdays and sundays he's like kevin nobody's here saturdays and sundays and i said that's okay i promise you i will just let myself in and i will work on the canvas or work on my roles i want to do spots i just i want to condition my body with the canvas he goes you're nuts but okay here's a key make sure you lock up and but i did and i was just so into it and that enthusiasm never wavered and I knew immediately, like the very first day I walked into a pro wrestling school, I said, oh, I should have did this a long time ago. So, Yeah, I think that it's because you're also so creative, too. Like, yes, you have your sports background, your, your MMA background. But I think also, like, I can see just from the stuff you posted on social media when you're on the indies and even now, um, you have that creative you know, brain that is, like, on fire wanting to do stuff. And you don't really get to flex that muscle – doing MMA as much as you do pro wrestling? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. It's, um, uh, you, you can't make mixed martial arts something that it's not. It is what it is. And um, to some degree, pro wrestling and sports entertainment, it has subjective lanes that have flexibility. You can make it a lot of different things, which is good because it caters to, you know, a 
variety of different demographics of different types of audiences and stuff like that. But yeah, there was definitely no room for any creativity with that. <laughs> well, let's get to you in the WWE. People are like, Ryan, get to some of the stuff of him talking about the, the stuff where he's in WWE, not his whole background in life. I wanted to know, so I was interested in all of that. Uh, so the past two years for you, have been like they have to just it has been the craziest roller coaster of life. Like, you know, you're on this like, you know, you're at your dream job, you're on this like super high where you're like, man, I'm I'm like the man in NXT. I this is exactly how I envisioned it being here. Next step, superstardom, you know, and then you get on the main roster and it's just like very different than what you expected, I imagine. And then you're not there anymore. And then you're back. So it's like this past two years, I, I can imagine just it's good that you're disciplined mentally because you've had a crazy past two years. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can say that. It's, it's funny. I uh, I talk to my wife about this sometimes. So the character, Karen Cross, is definitely not an underdog. You know, if given any sort of power whatsoever, this is a, a very – authoritarian tyrant type individual um, who is is less like a human being and more like a bad energy in the room that just loves to stir bad things up in people. He likes to attack people's identities, make them doubt what they're actually capable of, and wants to emasculate them and embarrass them publicly, wants to beat them up in front of their friends and family. And then the guy who plays him, <laughs> I've had every single thing you could possibly think of working against me. Um, you know, in terms of trying to achieve my goals, but in a really weird way, man, I wouldn't have it any other way because in the thick of it, let me tell you, um, it's terrible. I'm not going to give some sort of like fake motivation spiel and be like, listen, you just got to power through it, brother. Like it's no, like life is hard. We're all human. And, um, it's tough when you're in the thick of it, but I'm so glad that I've had prior experiences in my life where things have been difficult. And I know that if I persevere through stuff, that'll get through it. And it feels that much better once I've accomplished the task. Like I almost am a little disappointed when things are go kind of smooth <laughs> as I jinx myself and say that, <laughs> but uh, you know, from the, from the very beginning, you know, with NXT, we finally get there and go run right into a pandemic and there's no odds, you know? And that was like probably the, the most challenging period of anybody's career, anybody, anybody who's alive right now, their life. So, um, but at the same time, getting hired by WWE at that time provided me such um, an umbrella of safety during those times. You know, I was uh, a director of nightlife security operations in the city of Las Vegas at that time for a couple of different venues. And Las Vegas' economy is totally based on tourism. So I would have been out of work had I not gotten hired and signed. And not only that, um, my family was part of the group of people that got laid off. So I was able, as a son uh, or a grandson or a nephew or whatever, I was able to help support people in my family who needed the support. Um, and because I was hired by WWE at that time, um, you know, and then we get the title run, you know, when my shoulder breaks, it's like, oh my God. Um, then we go to main roster and, you know, on Raw, we did whatever we did, whatever you want to chalk that up and call that <laughs> you know, and then we get released. Oh my God. And then we're back in the Indies and everything was going actually very well. And then we come back and it's been very turbulent. But again, like, I kind of love it. I kind of love that it's never that easy because once we get to the end of the tunnel, it was like, you know, I, I look back and I'm like, holy cow, can you believe all that just happened? And we're on to the next, you know, adventure. <laughs> It's I, yeah, I I I can imagine you got to feel triumphant after something like that where you're like, man, I made it through that and we're back here and now it's even better. Okay, cool. Like I I guess I can I guess I can deal with whatever. Yeah. Definitely feels that way. When you look back though at the, you know, the first main roster run before you came back, like your favorite. <laughs> what what would you say you learned most in that run? <laughs> God, give me a second. Like, is there any oh one lesson you took with you from that first time that you're like, all right, this second time when you came back that you were like, I'm going to make sure I kind of do this 
thing a little differently or whatever, anything like that? It was another point in my life where, um, as I look back, you know, I had a bad gut feeling about everything and I decided to go along and do it anyways. And anytime I've ever trusted my gut, everything has always worked out. And I had a lot of people uh, encouraging me to kind of move forward with it, try to make the best of it. I was given really good advice by a lot of people that were ahead of me, um, but I just knew it was all wrong. Everything felt off. And like even people who weren't even in my shoes were watching felt like it was off. So I just know, I just chalked that up in my life as an experience where, you know, when I look back, I just say to myself, I knew this was all wrong and off from the very beginning. And I decided to go through with it. Don't do that again. <laughs> you know, I have to trust my gut feeling with this. Yeah. I think that's the best lesson to have learned from something like that because Ultimately, it is easy to be like, well, I want to be a team player. I'm just going to do what's asked of me. This is the thing that I want to be doing. I'm sure it'll get, it'll change. And then you see like, oh, maybe I probably should have, maybe not. Maybe I should have just spoken up a little there. Because I remember even you say like people who you don't know or people that weren't there. I remember I was there the night the Gladiator helmet debuted. And one of my coworkers, I was there with him. And he was backstage. He was like, I'm pretty sure they've got i sure they got Karen Cross in like a weird gladiator helmet now. Like, I don't know, man. This is a – I'm interested to see what this is all about because I do not think that's the best idea for this guy. But, I mean, it is what it is. At least you got through it, you know. At least you got through it. Sure. There have been, there have been worse gimmicks in the history of wrestling. It, it could have been worse. Let me put it that way. <laughs> uh, well, were you apprehensive at all about – coming back once Triple H reached out or were you kind of just happy to get another chance to do it right this time? I wasn't apprehensive at all because um, I just feel like, look, 99% of your success in this industry comes down to your ability to compose yourself under stress, uh, stress and pressure. Okay. So I knew coming back, um, or I felt, I should say, uh, I felt more, uh, I felt better with myself in terms of feeling confident to shoot down an idea or a theme or a project that I just knew wouldn't work. Um, at that time, economically speaking, certain people in my family, you know, that I was assisting. And then also on top of that, like the NXT run that they gave me, it was a murder run. They literally had me clean out everybody and everything. Complete clean kills on on everybody. I had no reason to believe that anything would, you know, you know, become weird or not work out or something like that. This is the one thing they're asking me to, to do finally that I'm not totally 100% on. You know, how foolish, in my mind, I was thinking how foolish it would look. The one time they asked me to do this thing, if I said no, I mean, all of that was in my head at the time. But uh, coming back, I didn't have any of those things to be worried about. And I was out there outside of WWE. Financially, my wife and I were good, and we were having fun and working on different projects and stuff like that. And we've always loved working for Hunter. Um, he's like the easiest boss that I've ever had in terms of like being accessible to discuss ideas with and stuff like that. But also on the flip side, too, he may not tell you this, but you know, excellence is expected. You know, he has a very, very high standard for all of his talents to meet. But while he's easy to talk to and, you know, he's everybody's favorite boss, like we all know that he expects us to bring it. And I think that brings out the best version of all of us. And I think that's one of the main reasons why people like to work with him. I, that's the type of boss that I prefer. You know, sometimes you have bosses that like to pit people against each other because they think that if everyone's kind of like competitive with each other, then it'll bring out the best of everybody and they're trying to fight for the attention of the guy at the top, you know, and, and see you can get there. Um, but I personally do better in a, in a creative environment where um, it's someone who I can collaborate with freely, but also know that they expect excellence from me and they want to be winners. They want it. They want us to win collectively. And I think that um, it's, it's, it's easier to kind of like want to run through a wall for that kind of person when, you know they expect the excellence, but also they have the guidance to help you 
achieve that excellence. Completely well said. Yeah, I I agree, and a lot of the a lot of the boys in the back would agree with that too. Yeah, he seems like a you know when you watch like documentaries on him, just like when or documentaries and you see him in there, especially when he was doing his thing at NXT. Just down to like the small details of like the entrances, and you see him like recreating the entrance before to kind of like hammer it out with people. And uh, I'm assuming you had a similar experience with yours because because you had an awesome entrance. I couldn't even tell you how much he's doing, but you can just tell. And literally every show, he's out there at ringside with everybody involved with everything. And I mean, that's we're very lucky to have that. So. Will he answer a text message quickly too? Is he that type? Before he got into this position on main roster, yeah, he'd be able to get back to you a little bit quicker. But now he's he's wearing a lot of hats. He's in charge of a lot of stuff. So if he doesn't get back to you immediately, it's pretty understandable. <laughs> Especially with a WrestleMania, you know, 20 days away or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, when he called you or reached out or whatever and wanted you to come back, uh, was it said right away that they wanted Scarlett to come back with you as well? Yeah, immediately he said, he goes, I want to jump on the call with the both of you. And we're just like, all right, here we go. <laughs> like, she was always telling me, she's like, I'm telling you one day that call's coming. I was like, yeah, maybe. She was like, no, not maybe. She goes, I can feel it intuitively. We're going to be back there. And sometimes I thought so too. And then sometimes I thought, you know, maybe not. Which, you know, would have been whatever it would have been. Um, but we are so happy that we are back. I mean, not even just to be in front of the universe, but like, I don't know. Like we just went to like five new countries over the last four or five months. Like very first time we were ever in Scotland, very first time we were in Switzerland, Germany, Saudi Arabia. Like we're flying all over the world together as a married couple being able to f perform. Like it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. I, I, you guys have a great relationship too. It's like, it's not someone who you're like, Oh, I don't want to spend all my time with this person. Like it's awesome that you get to spend all your time with this person. Cause sometimes I'm like, Oh, I don't want to, my wife, I didn't go hang out with my friends or whatever, but it's awesome that you guys are, you know, able to do that, travel the world together, perform at a high level. And I think that Scarlett genuinely does bring uh, a very unique element to your guys' act. Thank you. Now, you know, right from the very beginning, um, I looked at the functionality of how managers typically work in wrestling. And um, one thing, like before we got started in NXT, was I, I wanted to avoid accidentally creating a character to stand next to carrying cross that felt replaceable, you know, cause some managers, you know, sometimes it, you know, when somebody's watching something, it's like, you know, if that manager wasn't standing next to the particular talent, I don't think it would make a difference or maybe the talent might be better off or maybe the talent is overly dependent on the manager. I wanted to create a synchronicity between the two characters. And she totally understood that and was right on track with it where it's like, no, these characters work together, you know, this, this type of energy that they feed off of. Um, and we were working on that for a while um, in different ways uh, on the independents. We kind of just discovered that and we like a lot of the same films and stuff like that. So we were able to put that together and I, I wanted this character to feel important. You know, Scarlet, the yeah. character Scarlet, I wanted yeah. to feel very important. Um, sometimes her and I almost even think of Scarlet and Cross as a tag team instead of a wrestler and a manager. So. I think with that notion and intention behind developing that, it's why it comes off the way it does. That's interesting that you say that because, yeah, even though she is technically like your manager, it doesn't feel like a manager. It does feel like, you know, an, uh, a duo together that, that does have these different yin and yangs to each other. Like it's a real natural born killers vibe where it's like you got this scary uh, killer and you've got like, you know, the the – the crazy person beside him or whatever. And I, I love like the, the dynamic between the two of you guys. Thank you. Then we watched those movies and that's exactly, you kind of hit the nail on that before I could even say it. That was a, one of our favorite films. Natural born killers is such a good movie. Any Quentin Tarantino movie is good. Well, that's not that Quentin Tarantino movie. That's he's just in that movie. Right? That's not a Quentin Tarantino movie, right? Didn't he? Uh, Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone, thank you. Excuse me. But isn't he, like, in the movie, though? Am I, am I, I tripping? So. Maybe. Hold on. Now I got to see if I'm tripping here. Hold on. I got to know. Oh, no. He just... 
no, never mind. He's not in it. I'm thinking. No, I'm not, I'm thinking of someone else in that movie. But yes, great movie. Regardless, I love that movie. It's been. So, I gotta watch that movie. It's been way too long. Clearly, since I have seen it's, that movie, it has Tarantino vibes. It does. You know what I mean in terms of the violence and the uh, cutscenes and stuff like that. That's not the first time I've heard that before. Yeah, I don't know why I said that just now. I right when I said it, I was like, wait, that doesn't sound right. Right when I said it. Um, but you are a movie guy. Do you remember? Do you remember the first horror movie you saw? Because you seem to love horror movies. Oh, I think it was Nightmare on Elm Street. And it it messed me up for a very long time. I saw it way younger than I should have. <laughs> How old were you when you saw it? Probably like four or five years old. <laughs> One of my uncles says like a joke, a rib, put it on to scare the crap out of me. And around Halloween was chasing me around the house with a Freddy mask. <laughs> That's so funny. I had Cody on the show last week, and we were also talking about watching movies that we probably shouldn't have seen way too young. And it's I, I, now there's all these parental controls on everything, but it was much more of a free reign situation in the 90s and the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. If you had access to HBO, I mean, God knows what would have been on when you just turned the TV on one day. You know, Tales from the Crypt or... Oh, man, Friday the 13th, Halloween, Hellraiser. I saw all of those. What's the last? Do you remember the last horror movie that you were really all about? Well, um, I'm a very big David Cronenberg fan. Um, his son, Brandon Cronenberg, just did a film called Possessor, and I really liked that. Um, and I just recently saw Infinity Pool, which was a which is a David Cronenberg film. I'm more into the psychological horror. Um, but one of my favorite horror movies of all time aside from Hellraiser, so I went on public record to say that before, um, was a, uh, now, of course, now it's escaped from me, uh -oh. Videodrome. Okay. There it is. Videodrome. If you guys haven't, haven't ever heard that, I don't even want to tell you what the plot is. If you're, if you're 18 or older, <laughs> don't, don't put on Videodrome <laughs> and watch that. Not for four-year-olds? Not, not for four-year-olds? <laughs> Not really. No. <laughs> uh, okay, so WrestleMania is coming up. Uh, you're set for a five-way this week on SmackDown with the winner earning an IC title shot at WrestleMania against Gunther. What would it mean for you to earn a title match on the grandest stage of them all? To have a match against Gunther for the IC title? I mean, it's so hard to put into words. I mean, you've been watching wrestling your whole life, so, I mean, it's hard to... I guess really say, but I mean, there's gonna be a lot of people at that show. I feel like, I feel like it's one of those shows where everybody on the roster wants a spot there because it's like in the heart of LA. It's gonna be a bajillion people in there. Uh, so I, yeah, I can imagine being part of a title match would be an honor. It's it's everything, and you know, when it comes to careers, there's only so many WrestleManias you're gonna be able to be a part of. You know what I mean? This is one of them, and. Um, this is this is the Super Bowl. <laughs> Be a nice way to cap off that two year roller coaster with a with a title match at WrestleMania. I I'm a very big believer in earning what you get, and I never want to be handed anything in this business. You know, it's like we were talking about earlier about really striving for it, chasing it, grinding out for it. I definitely believe in earning every single thing that you get, and I'm going to do my best to earn it this Friday. Hell yeah. All right. Well, we've reached the end of the show here, but I like to end every show with a segment that I call. If I do it right there, it is the finishing move. Uh, graphics are up. I, usually there's lights. I was confused where the lights were. I was waiting for that. But we will carry on here. Carrying Cross didn't mean to say that, but okay. Uh, what's your least favorite move to be on the receiving end of? Is there one that just like really hurts that you're just like, man, I do uh, not right enjoy. Now, it. Yeah, I, I don't know. Right, right now would probably be the claymore because <laughs> things seem to go not so well for a while after I take one. So, <laughs> the curse of the boot. <laughs> um, did you come up with the cross jacket name, or was it someone else? It was someone else. Who who was it? He's dead now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it was a friend of mine. Well, that was depressing. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> Former friend. Got it. Excommunicated yeah. person. Got it. We will not find out who did that. <laughs> I 
lastly, uh, what's the most memorable time that you've hit your finisher or locked in your finisher on someone and why? Rey Mysterio in our last singles match. Most memorable um, to me, and the reason being is because I've been watching Rey Mysterio since I was a little kid. The very first time I saw Rey Mysterio wrestle was against Hubert Guerrero back in ECW. I think Hubie powerbombed him on a car. It was just an insane match, you know? And I remember growing up as a little kid watching Luchadors, you know, when you, when you play wrestle with your friends and you say, I'm Hulk Hogan or I'm Ultimate Warrior, you know, you look at your friend and you're like, you don't look like Hulk Hogan, you don't look like Ultimate Warrior. It's kind of hard for me to get into this. But with Luchadors, you know, you could take your shirt off, your t-shirt, you can put it on your head and, you know, you can tie it on the back and suddenly now you're like a luchador, you know? And um, I just, especially spending so much time in Mexico as well, in Lucha Libre to be able to work with the greatest baby face of all time. Um, it was just surreal to be in that moment for me. So it was a, it was a, it was a pleasure to work with him. That was the one topic I had here that I didn't get to was I just wanted to like mark out about ECW for a while. Cause I, it feels like from following you and your retweets that you were an ECW guy. Huge, huge. I can't even begin to, oh, that's a whole other episode, man. <laughs> Yeah, I saw the like literally right before we were gonna start here. I saw you retweet a, a, a Mike Awesome video in ECW, and I was like, oh, that that the, the Mike Awesome Masato Tanaka series is like, I think the thing that got me into that style of like just hard hitting wrestling. Same uh, Tanaka and Awesome actually took me backwards into All Japan, New Japan, and King's Road, and I it's not that I didn't have an interest. I just I didn't realize that what they were demonstrating was what all of that was about. And I couldn't believe that there were these other worlds there, you know, and I've taken and learned stuff from that. And I have brought it into, you know, my ring patterns and stuff like that in WWE. So. Yeah. Mike Awesome's definitely guy who doesn't get enough credit because of everything that happened with ECW. But man, like that guy was the man back then. Same with Masato Tanaka, but both, the, both those guys uh, that, that I love those guys. Absolutely. All right, we're done here. I will next time we will have fun talking about ECW. But uh, I appreciate you coming on here very much. I'm glad we finally got to do this. So have a great day, man. Me too. Good talking to you as always. Great talking to you. All right, that was my conversation with Carrie and Cross. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Super cool dude. Super fun to pick his brain. Before we get out of here, though, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Make sure if you're on this YouTube channel, the WWE on Fox YouTube channel, and you're looking at my pretty face here, well, pretty-ish face here, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. There's a button down there somewhere, like, subscribe, all that stuff. You know the spiel. You've heard it in a million YouTube channels, but hook it up. Subscribe to the channel. You're going to get this show every Wednesday. You're going to get YouTube shorts, clips from Raw and SmackDown. There's a community tab and so much more. So make sure if you're watching this right now, I'm, I'm pointing at you and I'm talking to you specifically. You. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. And if you've been listening to all that, you didn't see me shaming the person on video, but that's what I was doing. I was pointing at that person if they haven't subscribed yet on camera. But you should be subscribed to the WWE on Fox YouTube channel too if you're just listening to this. Also, all of you should make sure that you are also subscribe to the Add a Character podcast feed. That's where you can find the audio version of this show. So if you don't have time to watch on YouTube, you can watch while you're doing your daily activities. But also, you can listen to two other shows weekly on there. Raw and SmackDown Roundups. I'm breaking each of those shows down segment by segment every week via the audio podcast platform. So make sure you're subscribed to the Add a Character podcast feed as well. And lastly, lastly, if you're watching this, you should be following the WWE on Fox uh, social media platforms as well. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I know you. You're addicted to your phone. You're on all of those. So make sure you're following us there as well. Lots of fun stuff and lots of stuff to be consuming on your phone all day long if you're following the WWE on Fox social media platforms. All right, that's it. I'm done. Officially tapping out for now. Until next time. I'm Ryan Satin, and this has been Out of Character.